All right. Welcome, everyone, to the Jay Davis Show. Uh, today, I am super excited to have Richard Kane with us. Uh, and welcome to the show, Richard. It's a pleasure to be here, Jay. Thank you for yeah. that. Well, why don't we start? Uh, do you want to kind of tell people a little bit more about yourself and, and what you've been working on uh, throughout your career? Certainly. So I'm a researcher in artificial intelligence. I've got cornerstone patents in AI. I'm a mathematician. I'm a computer programmer. And all of that is incredibly boring. But I've taken those things and, and went from routing telephone calls to routing fleets of jets in the United States, saving metric tons of carbon, 7% of their operating cost. And in all of that work, I spotted a gap in our industry, which is we were flying heavy metal jets for short hops where they can't be high and efficient. They're low and slow, environmental catastrophes, unsafe, really disastrous. And I decided to start an airline using a new type of machine, carbon fiber, single pilot, single engine, parachute equipped, can land itself with an AI, something that's safer, more environmentally friendly, just better for those short haul missions. So basically the data demanded I do this. Um, we were flying heavy metal jets at an average speed of 243 knots with an average passenger count of 1.8 people. And there was just a better way to do that. So it's, that's how we got her. Yeah, I never saw myself as an airline yeah. CEO, but it's 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 what happens when you want to change things. Yeah, no, I love it. That is uh, it, it's such an amazing kind of gap in the industry. Uh, how did you? How did that kind of process uh, happen? I, I'm always fascinated with innovation and the process by which people innovate. Was that kind of an aha moment? Was it gathering little pieces of data? over time, how did that, how did that look like for you? So there were two steps to this. The, the math problem that I tackled is called the traveling salesman problem. Okay. And it's not something you compute a solution to. It's something you tackle with brute force. And it's a supercomputer class problem and it's um, a factorial problem. So imagine a deck of cards and you perfectly shuffle that deck of cards by the way, uh, Dean Kamen gave me the way to talk about this finally. No human being has ever held the same perfectly shuffled deck of cards. It's 52 times 51 times 50 times 49. You know, it's like you're getting into the number of stores in the universe type of numbers. Yeah. And you can't work through that in a computer. By the time you got the answer, the data would have changed. Two planes would have broken. The weather would have changed. Three new bookings would have happened. So you're trying to tackle this, and I tackled it in the worst possible place inside of phone networks. So 100 million calls an hour, 14 billion a month. Software as a service base is 68% of you, but uh, on audited financials doing this, but I only had three seconds to make a routing decision. And if you looked at the world's phone networks, they're this patchwork quilt, and you're just zigzagging through all the little companies, and it makes an enormous difference on the the rates that carriers pay each other, what path you're taking, and what agreements you make. So we did this for about a decade. I took six regional phone companies, went after AT&T and MCI. This work is part of the reason long distance calling is nearly free in the United States now. And routing phone calls for a decade gets kind of boring. And on the board of that company was Peter Diamandis, creator of XPRIZE, pilot. I'm a pilot. We thought, what else are we going to do with all this routing firepower? Let's do something that's never been done before. Let's take it and adapt it to aviation. Instead of hundreds of millions of calls an hour, let's tackle 10,000 flights a day and just overwhelm this and be able to dynamically reoptimize fleets. So I did that for a decade. The best floating fleet operators in the U.S. have run my AI from time to time. It saves them 7% of their operating costs. Uh, has huge impact. We were flying 40% empty, and now we're flying 20% empty. And it's uh, that's you know, unbelievable. Just better environment, better cost. But in all of that, I saw we're flying heavy metal jets like Challengers from impossibly short runways like Santa Monica to Las Vegas that's only 200 miles. And they can't climb high or be fast or be efficient. In fact, they can barely stop in 3,500 feet. Um, they occasionally go off runways with guilt people. And I thought there had to be something better. And when you look at it, the data just screamed. You're not getting any speed. These machines should be high and fast and cross an ocean 
or a continent, but there's something more going on. They're metal. And every time you inflate them, there's uh, stress on the airframe called metal fatigue. And so you lose as much life doing these 20 minute hops as if you crossed an ocean or a continent. So no one wants to use their heavy metal jet to do these short hops. So carbon fiber fixes the metal fatigue. One engine adapted from a cruise missile designed to go low and slow and be efficient fixes the performance envelope. You take that all together and we're one third to one ninth to fuel burn. Much quieter. I've got the quietest jet ever. It's 50 decibels quieter than stage four noise requirements. Much safer. It can land itself. It has a parachute. It has an AI. But more than that, it's designed to take off and land in 2,000 feet as opposed to a very long runway with lots of fuel going lots of distance. It's just a better solution. And the data just screamed, Richard, start an airline. Richard, you got to fix this. I even tried to get other people to do it, but this is a very unique machine that we fly dispatched by an AI and something really different for aviation. And it was too radical for people to get the heads around. So I had to just do it myself. You know, that's how we got here. I love it. That's amazing. Uh, how did you guys get to um, uh, making that decision to use the, the Cirrus jet? What, what was that process like? I've been looking at the jet for a long time. I also evaluated other machines, some piston singles. You might know Piper was trying to make a single engine yep. jet. You might know Eclipse was trying. They all kind of failed. Diamond and the DJ. And people would come to me. And um, apologies to Todd House, former CEO of your jet. But he wanted to do this with the Diamond jet. He had a great plan. He's going to run my AI operation software. That's how I know it. But the Diamond jet didn't materialize. And the whole time I'm asking people, wait for the Cirrus jet. It's the perfect machine. Cirrus ran into program delays as well. And, you know, you have to be patient. I didn't even launch on the generation one of the Vision jet. I waited for generation two, another two years, because I wanted the feature set of the G2. It's quieter, it goes higher, and faster. So some of this was patience. Some of this was steering the feature set. I hope that some of our design requests will be in the generation three and four of these machines. Um, it's just a, it's the right platform for this job. Yeah. And there's a lot that goes into it. The human factors of having giant windows so you don't feel claustrophobic and a cabin that makes, just comes across as spacious when it has no right to be. It's a small jet, but the experience is incredible. And then there's some esoteric things. We have this big Y tail and a little X. The X is active turbulence suppression. It's going like this the whole time like roll control on a yacht to keep you from getting seasick. So people say this is the smoothest jet they've ever been in, quietest, best visibility, enormous windows. It changes what people think about aviation. And then they can land it themselves by the touch of a button without pilots. And then in the case of a real emergency, they can fire a rocket motor, blows out a parachute, lowers the whole airplane to the ground. This kind of stuff never existed before. And it just, it's overwhelming for people. It changes what they think aviation is. It actually makes it back into a joyous experience instead of a cattle car in the back of a commercial airliner. One, one more thing to count upon. When you get on an airliner, you drive to the big airport. You have to get there an hour before your flight. God help you if you're connected. Your door-to-door -door travel speed is 75 miles an hour, sometimes less. The jet's amazing. It goes five or 600 miles an hour. But with hub and spoke and TSA, we shackled it. It doesn't make sense to fly 200 miles anymore. You're just going to drive. There's no short haul advantage to fly. On the other hand, if you can get in one of our gents, go to the small local airport. Because we operate on short runways, we operate from 5,400 airports. You can go right from your origin to your destination. The speed is now back to 300 miles an hour. And this is a NASA program started about 30 years ago called the Small Aircraft Transportation System. They funded the VJet 2 prototype to show carbon fiber, single engine, light jet optimized single pilot short runways to open up all this fabric. And so now you're going 300 miles an hour door to door. To quote NASA now, this is unlocking the fourth wave of high speed travel. That's exactly eight years from the first car to the last horse in Manhattan. That's the change they're trying to bring about. Every time you double the speed of travel, you change out the underlying technology. That's what we're trying to do. Just alter the hub and spoke infrastructure of the US and Europe. So that's what this project is about. I think it's something that, especially for entrepreneurs, uh, it's just such a fascinating 
world. And, and it's something that I think a lot of entrepreneurs uh, aspire to. They want to they have their own uh, private jet, uh, but it's very uh, expensive and, and kind of feels intimidating. How have you guys been able to, how has Verijet been able to kind of overcome some of those fears and concerns? Uh, and maybe even walk through what it looks like for, for whether it's an entrepreneur or someone else, but what does it look like to, to use uh, your guys' planes? Certainly. So if you're just a member of the general public, you don't need a membership. You just call us and fly. We prefer to know the day before, but we've done two-hour call-outs. And that's $4,000 an hour for the entire jet on your schedule, direct service between any airports. So now you're flying directly to your destination. I can connect hundreds of city pairs in California in 40 minutes. That will literally take four to six hours on commercial. And if you're buying a couple of first class tickets, it's about the same price yeah. point. If you're trying to get there and back to your meeting in the same day, you can't do it commercial. But with us, you don't need the three hotel rooms and the nice rental car for the three attorneys who are also going to charge you as they connect in San Fran or something. Yeah. Um, get them back and forth to the same day and home to their families. So that's 4000 an hour retail. Our jet card holders get $3,500 an hour. Our investors get $2,500 an hour. In all cases, if you're operating in our service areas, 600 nautical around Santa Maria, California, White Plains, New York, Orlando, Florida, McKinney, Texas, in those circles, there's no reposition charges. It's only flight time. So this is the least expensive private jet. But it's more than that. You don't get carbon shame. I hold records for efficiency, speed, and distance in all types of aircraft. But in particular, in this jet, I hold the world efficiency record for jets and the world close course distance record for jets, burning 39 gallons an hour. That's more like an SUV than a jet. This is, again, something radically different. Today, we're carbon neutral with four air. But tomorrow, you'll find an LOI with dimensional energy where we're carbon zero. And I, I don't mean this in a greenwashing way. I mean this in sequestering carbon out of the atmosphere, cracking carbon dioxide to carbon monoxide, combining with hydrogen under pressure. Out come long chain hydrocarbons easily refined to jet fuel. No feedstock. We're not taking food off anyone's table. More than that, if you have a source of clean electricity, like for instance, Niagara Falls, where the first plant is going, hydroelectric, it literally is carbon zero. So that's the ingredients, clean electricity, uh, water and air, and outcomes comes fuel. It's very hard to argue with that. And what I'm trying to do is remove the barriers to adoption of, of widespread private travel, because what I want to do is change the hub and spoke infrastructure. So you take all these things together, and then you wrap it in a jet that's 50 decibels quieter than stage four noise requirements. So the most noise-sensitive airports in the world welcome this jet. We flew two overhead at 1,000 feet in formation over the mayor of Pensacola, and it was inaudible on the ground. So there's no noise complaints. We were invited to open the Blue Angels Air Show, which we did with one of our jets. And they came back and said that our jet's too cute and too quiet to be in the air show in front of 140,000 people. But that's the whole point. It's quiet. Uh, more recently, we were invited to bring them all back. They want us to fly the entire fleet ahead of the Blue Angels in the July air show, which will be amazing. Incredible. Yeah. Um, by the way, if I may segue here, it's really important that our pilots are happy to be at Verajet. So we let them use the aircraft for personal use. We got them a seaplane. But we also team them with military aviators and teach them the fly formation. These are things that no airline would ever dream of doing. And yet it's an incredible experience for our pilots. So it keeps them engaged and happy. And when they meet our customers, our customers are blown away. The feedback I always get is I've flown with many of your pilots. We love them. They're all excited to be here. They're all incredible representatives for your company. Um, I oversubscribed my Series A by 165% because people kept calling me and saying, customer service is a lost art in the US. Your pilots are amazing. The plane's incredible. May I give you a million dollars? And that happened four times in a row and I oversubscribed the A. It's happening again with our B round convertible note. It's what powers the company. We're just changing how people experience aviation. And it's, it goes back to having an incredibly happy bunch of pilots. Five of my six board members are pilots. I'm a pilot. They've all volunteered to get type rated in the jets we fly. This is unique in the airline industry. You don't find that 
So it's 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 a good yeah. recipe. It's um and it's very people and it's amazing. I I think that's it's so interesting to me and and I'll make a comparison and hopefully this is uh, a comparison that that works and makes sense. But in many ways, it's the the flying car uh, dream that everyone has had for so long brought to reality. I, I mean, I think a lot of times people talk about that and it's like, well, where do you where do you drive and and it seems almost as you run going through those numbers as a as an entrepreneur, I'm like, oh, that totally makes sense. Like we just flew twelve people from our team to Vegas for a show. Uh, and a lot of people went in, you know, Saturday night, left Sunday night or left Monday morning. And all of a sudden, exactly what you said, we started looking at hotels and cars, uh, and you, and it's, and then flights. I mean, that's, that's another piece of it. And, uh, all of a sudden $4,000 to fly, uh, the, the serious vision is five seater, four seater. It's four adults and two kids plus oh, yeah. pilot, so six seater. And so, yeah, I mean, it's it's amazing. Uh, and so that, that's so interesting to me that that this is really disrupting in that way. And I think it's exciting for everyone. So um, this is the first time I've had the chance to announce this. Uh, today, this morning, um, we announced a, a SPAC merger with New Vista. New Vista includes some of the brightest people in aviation including the former uh, CEO of Boeing, Dennis Mullenberg. He and I see exactly eye to eye on where this is going. And so since you mentioned flying cars, I'm just going to go there. There's a machine that takes off vertically, flies horizontally. Instead of $800 of jet fuel, uses $20 of electricity. Instead of a 100-hour inspection on the motors, conceivably it could be 30,000 hours. Think more like Tesla Model 3 motor. No wear, no oil changes, no tune-ups, just keep going because it's electric and air-gapped and only has a few moving parts. So we are planning to operate those, and you'll see announcements in the next days and weeks about some of these things. Um, but absolutely, we're going to democratize private travel. We already have. We're the least expensive private jet option. We're the most environmentally friendly. But right now, it's more suitable to empty the first-class cabin and if you ask me what my goal is, it's to empty the first class cabin of United and Delta when you're connecting through O'Hare and Hartsfield and there's no direct service. Yeah. But with this other machine, yeah. the coach cabin, it's actually cheap enough. It costs less than Uber ground to operate and you can commute to work on it. It's so inexpensive. In my personal dream world, in 2028 for the Olympics in LA, we're moving a good fraction of the attendees by our machines non-polluting, thousand times safer than a helicopter. So that's in our business plan as well. That's where we're going. You're exactly right, flying cars. I've done two TED Talks. The second one celebrated George Jetson's birthday and talked about flying yeah. cars. It's, it's spot on. I love it. Well, this is, uh, man, it's fascinating. I, I could keep talking about this forever. Um, a, a lot of our listeners are, are entrepreneurs, people who are running companies, um, what, what have been some of the, uh, unexpected lessons you have learned as you've, uh, built Verajet? What are some of those things that you would pass on to people who are maybe getting going in the process or even someone who's doing it, uh, and, and is still, I think every entrepreneur I ever met, I love because they're, they're constant learners. So, so what are some of those lessons you would share from, from building Verajet? So I have raised a modest amount of money. And I had 16 million promised from two airlines. I won't name them, but uh, 8 million from one major and one regional. And the idea was I was going to give them a perfectly trained pipeline of pilots from a high performance piston single, the SR 22, to our jets to the right seat of an airliner. And everything was going to plan. I planned to take my pilots and give them the ability to fly for a United or a Delta if they wanted to fly heavy iron with 300 people in the back. Some pilots, that's what they want to do. And COVID hits, and 16 million evaporated in two weeks. And I had a board, several board members telling me, keep your powder dry, shut down the airline, stop, and just hope you survive for three years. And of course, we never would have launched. So one is the agility and the ability to pivot. In my case, I looked around. The only people with powder dry were the family offices. So I engaged the family office networks, 
did a road show. These were the people that still needed to travel to visit their portfolio companies. This was the kind of sidestep that books get written about in entrepreneurism. And um, it sounds like I'm patting myself on the back, but this was pure survival. Yeah. I, I didn't know what else to do. I mean, it's, it's like there were six or seven weeks where my own board was essentially telling me to shut down. The second is don't necessarily listen to your board. They're there as advisors. They don't run the company. Yeah. Um, there's been a few windows where listening to them would have changed the course of this company. Uh, even today, I have those discussions. Um, just be fearless. Don't, don't take no. One of our board members, Peter, says no just means go to the next level up and just you know, keep at it. Um, no one lives your vision the way you do. So a mistake I make frequently is to depend on outside counsel too much. You have to kind of be true to your own yeah. vision. And so last year, this fall, we had two hurricanes. Hurricanes normally are a benefit to charter operators. Everyone wants to flee. Power's out for a week. You move them all around. You move supplies. By the way, we donate flights, and I've personally flown relief supplies to hurricane areas, and we move animals, all sorts of great things about it. But in this case, they popped up so fast, there wasn't time for anyone to evacuate. And instead of a boon, it turned into $400,000 of cancellations of flights that we had. And then you may not know we had a parachute pull in our fleet at the end of November. It was a mechanical issue with the machines combined with some training. It's been completely resolved. Two days after the parachute pull, we had the best day in the history of the company and 3,000 more Instagram followers. So something that you know looked bad actually showed that our safety systems work. I, uh, I picked up that pilot that evening. We had dinner, and the next day he flew me home, and he's back flying the line, completely uninjured. Spectacular save with this machine. Um, these safety systems are game-changing, and, and that's why they're here. But the parachute pull required us to bring our planes into maintenance. Now we had a blizzard. So these were four black swan events, back to back yeah. to back to back. And I ran low on cap. So the number one entrepreneurial concept is don't run out of cash. Yeah. Right? Um, don't run out of cash heading into a downturn is even better, especially when you're running an airline. So December was touch and go. Getting back to that incredible customer service that we have, all of our check card holders doubled their deposits. And then we have uh, PE investors that were announced today. And so we turned a corner, but you know, I had some unpleasant board calls and I had to ask board members, myself included, to write checks. And that's embarrassing for an entrepreneur. If you can avoid that, you know, just don't run out of cash. Don't take no for an answer. And sometimes don't listen to your board. Those would be the three things. And be ready to dance when uh, airlines cancel all future flight training because of COVID without any warning. <laughs> yeah. I think that's great advice. I think it's something that it's hard. I feel, I feel like I, as an entrepreneur, sometimes struggle with that same where I, I listen almost too much and I, uh, I'm too willing to give up my vision because someone who I view as more experienced or smarter than me tells me it's the wrong move. And it's a hard lesson to learn of like, this is, I am running the company. I'm not, the board members don't run this and they're not accountable like I am. And so I think that's very wonderful counsel. All that is amazing. Love it. They're not living it. Now try it when your investors bring in the guy who two NetJets operations, the president of FedEx shipping, the co-founder of ExoJet and the CEO of Boeing. <laughs> and you got to stand your ground when you don't agree. And it's, wow, it, it yeah. takes a gut check to do yeah. that. And it's been fun and we're yeah. learning things. It's It's been brilliant to have people who have deep thoughts in the industry work. Yeah, with. I love it. Well, uh, the time has flown by. We're usually about 20 minutes. We're already at 25 because this has been so fascinating. Uh, what would you ask our listeners? Uh, what would you like them to go do? Do you want them to follow you on Instagram? Do you want them to uh, go to your homepage and check it out? What, what's kind of a good call to action for people that they can go do something for you? So for us, uh, verijet.com. 833 Barry Jets, follow some of the media. Mostly, I have something that looks like a little plastic toy with a V-tail, and it's really different. And it's amazing. I promise it's a transformational, amazing experience. But I don't have a way to communicate that. We've tried VR. I've tried videos. 
I need to get butts and seats. When someone flies us, on average, they fly with us four more times that year, and then they turn into card holders or investors. So my number one ask would be to reach out, try us for a flight, bring your friends, go to a game, do something like that. And I promise you it will be transformational. I love it. Reach out to me. Maybe we can do some demo flights for you, but that's what I need to do is get people to experience it once. And then you'll see you don't have to be in the back of a cattle car anymore. Yeah. I actually just watched on YouTube a couple of weeks ago. It wasn't even, I I don't think we'd booked uh, the podcast yet, but I I watched the, uh, I love looking at jets. (laughs) And so I I saw a walkthrough of the kind of highest tier uh, version of the G of the Gen two, and was just blown away at, at all the features and I mean just an amazing aircraft. So it's pretty pretty incredible. So we'll we'll have everybody go do that and connect with you and yeah, fantastic. Thank you. It's been such a privilege to talk to you today. You too. Very enjoyable. You have a great time. Thank, about thank you. you so much. We'll we'll stay on. I want to I want to talk to you a little bit about Provo. So thanks everyone. Uh, Thanks, everyone, for coming. Richard, thank you for all that you shared with us. Really appreciate it.